Welcome to Building Healthy Relationships, the Four Habits podcast, helping you enjoy better harmony at home, thrive at work, and win at life. Here are your hosts, Dr. Andrea and John Taylor Cummings, recognized authorities on the subjects of improving work relationships and cultures, as well as couple and home relationships. Well, welcome and welcome back to another exciting episode of our podcast. Yep. Today we have Robert J. Gardner with us here today. We're super excited to have you with us, Rob. Rob is a long-term friend. We've worked together for many years, uh, known Rob and his family now for, for many years as well, and followed his journey. I've followed his journey for, what, I was thinking about it the other day, 15 years, maybe even 20 years now. It was 20. I think we're approaching 20. Yeah. 20 years, my, oh my goodness gosh. gracious me. So a long journey. Yeah, there's a whole lot that we could talk to Rob about. But before he, he comes on, I want to give him his due, uh, as we like to do here, and actually tell you a bit about the man behind the, 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 the uh, camera at the, the, camera moment, at the yeah. moment, or if you're just hearing or listening on, on uh, audio, uh, the man that you're about to hear. So Rob Gardner, Rob is an entrepreneur, an investor, and an innovator with a proven track record of success in protecting and growing assets in the pensions and wealth management industry. And that's where I know Rob from. Uh, previously director of investments at the FTSE 100 company, St. James Place, SJP. Uh, he managed £150 billion um, pounds of client investments. Rob is also a successful B Corp founder, having built companies such as Reddington and Mallow Street, where I know him from, and, a, and the, uh, the financial education charity, Red Start fabulous little uh, initiative that was. But so many other initiatives we're going to hear about, and that's why <laughs> we're excited about this Absolutely. podcast as well. Now, Rob's dream is a world worth living in economically, environmentally, and socially. He's currently the co-founder and co-CEO of Rebalance Earth, and we're going to talk a bit about that in a moment. And Rebalance Earth is all about creating high-integrity nature credits that protect and grow biodiversity and generate prosperity for the communities that preserve nature and capture carbon. Over the next decade, Rebalance Earth aims to protect and restore nature, capturing over one gigaton, and Rob will tell us how much that is, <laughs> of CO2 and generating daily income for millions worldwide to create a world worth living in. A world worth living in. Those and Rob, my, you know, you have done so much in the, the time that we've known you, so many things that you, we want you to share from your experience, but we need to start by what's the passion now? What's driving your focus now? And then we'll unpack it from there. Yeah, well, look, firstly, uh, John, Andrea, congratulations on this podcast. Uh, I, I still remember when you asked me about doing a, a TEDx talk and I, I was trying to think when that was and obviously you've written a book and, you know, you now set up your company. And so I, I've, I've loved watching your TED talk uh, and, and, and actually now listening to this podcast. So, so, so well done. Thank uh, you. Well, you inspire us along the way. So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so look, I was very lucky back in 2012, 2013, I met a guy called Mike Harris, who was the founder of, uh, First Direct, uh, he was the founder of Egg. And his whole idea of this was this kind of concept called purpose beyond money. And, and he was getting me to think about purpose long before HBR and everyone was saying, get, get to purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for a long time, my purpose was what if everyone could be confident uh, and in control uh, of their financial future? And so that kind of, whether it was Reddington helping make 100 million people financially secure or Mallow Street helping to sort of create a better retirement for everyone or, or Red Start that's trying to change the game for sort of 4.7 million young kids to understand how money works and how to make it work for them. That's always been my sort of guiding star. I, I suppose more recently, uh, I started reflecting, going, well, there's no point in sort of being financially free or having financial well-being if we don't have a world worth living in. Mm. Yeah. And so my my overarching framework is financial freedom in in a world worth living in and uh and so for me the financial freedom is everything that I've done with the businesses uh, you know I've also written the children's book Save Your Acorns I've written another book called called Freedom uh and that's really about in helping and inspiring people put in place the good habits in the same way that you're trying to do around relationships. You know, yeah, how, how can I help people have a better relationship with money, not be scared of it, embrace it and make it work for them. At the same time, sadly, I think we are at a critical junction in human history where uh, I think we need to do something 
not just about climate change, but about nature loss. And, you know, in the last 50 years, we've lost 70 percent of all of our wildlife. You know, in Africa, we used wow. to have 10 million Af- elephants. We now got less than half a million. In the UK, we used to have wow. 80,000 hectares of seagrass, which is home to millions of fish uh, and even more invertebrates. And we've now only got uh, 8,000. And, you know, I know you do a lot of stuff in the workplace. Mm. Imagine if you lost 70% of your team, you wouldn't be able to function. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Planet Earth, Team Earth has lost yeah. 70% of our team because our team isn't just humans. It's yeah. It's the bees that we rely on. It's the fish that we need to live up. Like all of it mm. uh, is what makes it a world worth living in. And so I've probably financial freedom in a world worth living in. I'm dialing up the world worth living in. And and look, mm. I had an amazing job. I worked for uh, SJP. I, you know, I was right in my passion zone. You know, how do you help well, make yeah, yeah. people? We had clients who were literally babies and we had quite a few clients who were over the age of 100. So it was bang in my kind of wheelhouse mm. of of financial freedom but you know I, i've just turned 45 when you know and understand just how bad climate change is and just how bad nature loss and biodiversity is i didn't want to wake up 10 years from now age 55 mm. and my daughters look at me and they say well dad what did you do you knew well, and daddy, understood. Exactly. I mean, when you yeah. know and understand the problem and i just wanted to go all in uh, and so yeah. i i quit an amazing job a year ago, almost exactly, uh, and joined my co-founder, uh, Walid, uh, with the idea, our big idea is that we think nature is the most valuable asset on the planet, more valuable than equities, yeah. more value than property. Uh, you know, academics have said the value of the ecosystem services of nature is about $140 trillion. Now, that's an, a big, big number that doesn't mean anything to many people, but it's about one and a half times global economic growth. So. It is insanely valuable. We just don't value it. And the way I kind of explain it is that we're all used to subscriptions, whether it's podcasts or TV. And for the last four billion years, we've been on the freemium model of nature. And now (laughs) we pay for nature. And the purpose of Rebalance Earth is to demonstrate that the companies who benefit the most from nature are need to pay for nature and Mm -hmm. with that money what i call sort of financing green we can then start to restore nature and then restore nature we sort of create a world worth living in not not just from a sort of moral perspective but actually it helps us from an economic prosperity perspective from a mental health and and well-being uh perspective so that that's where my passion lies but but you know Red Star, uh, the financial education charity, you know, it's not a small thing. We're going to, you know, in 2030, if we're successful, we're going to change the lives of 4.7 million children Mm -hmm. in the UK. We're working with 45 schools across Cardiff, Bristol, Edinburgh, Lower Staff, London. Uh, These are some of the poorest schools in the UK. And we're doing a longitudinal study with King's College Policy Institute to, to demonstrate that actually if we teach children early enough about money and form those good habits, they're less likely to make bad decisions about money when they're 16 around buy now, pay later. They're more likely to engage with their pension fund and then they're going to less likely have divorce. As you know, divorce, you know, one of the major causes of divorce is money issues. One of the major causes of mental health yeah. is, 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 is money. So, uh, and, and by the way, the two link in, because where it all links in is that where we save our money, how we save our money uh, can have a, can have a real impact uh, on, on that, and we, that's yeah. where they overlap and yeah. we absolutely want to dive in that let me just say you know rob your passion <laughs> is infectious i think a lot of people will just come off this call and want to pay a lot more attention to what's going on with climate change and and get involved oh, with that or nature as an asset as you, as you as you rightly put it there where i think in the past there's been uh, what i was picking up from what you're saying is People have picked off nature. They've picked off the oil. They've picked off the timber where they can make money. And the, but they thought, and the whole piece. There, there are actually bits out there which we've neglected. But as you said, it's, it's you know it's a big ch- it's a biggest asset out there. What can we be doing about those other bits that, that have been neglected so far? Investing in them to make sure the whole thing can stay together. And if we don't, all the things that we're placing value on now will disappear. Like you know, one earthquake, one hurricane, one storm, property, all the things that we're <laughs> edging our finances on. Will go. 
So we're recording this the first week of January and anyone in the UK will know that there are flood warnings across the entire of yep. the UK. Now, that is down to two things. One is climate change will mean that rainfall and rainfall intensity is higher, but yep. that is not the only cause of flooding. If people remember COVID, there was the curve and flattening the curve. Mm -hmm. The same happens with rivers. There's this thing called a hydrological curve, which measures the rate at which water moves through the river basin. Mm. Now, what's happened in the UK, we've altered the course of 90% of our rivers. So our rivers are not in what's called <laughs> dynamic equilibrium. And right. so we've done the opposite of flatten the curve. We've steepened the curve. So what that means is every time there's a lot of rainfall, the water hits our fields, flows through, it hits our roads and our cement, and it yeah. hits the rivers faster and they rise quicker. And that exacerbates the flooding problem. So the flooding that we are experiencing right now has been made worse as a direct consequence of our actions globally because of climate change, but locally in the UK as a direct consequence of the fact that we've changed all of our rivers. And so one of the things we're going to be doing at Rebalance Earth yeah. is restoring as much as we can those rivers to be in dynamic equilibrium, which will mitigate and reduce the impact of flooding. On mm -hmm. the flip side, it also reduces the risk of drought because there's now more okay. water in the basement in the summer. Mm -hmm. It also will help with water quality issues and all. And then if we address that, it will also help address all of the sewage overflow issues that probably everyone read about last last year. And so yes. I just want to make it really tangible for anyone, any of your listeners here in the UK, because if 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 you if you remember January 2024, you'll remember one thing. It was very rainy, it was very yep. windy, but the floods were awful. Trains were closed from Lo Leeds to London. From You can't get from London to Bristol. Uh, uh, people's homes are being damaged, as you said, Andrea. It's, it's, it's a real tangible impact. And, and the, the truth is we can change it. Well, and that's the thing with the whole climate change conversation. We should have been having this conversation a long time ago, but we didn't see it happening. We didn't experience no. it. And so it was too far in the future. One of the things I love about the way you communicate, Rob, is you 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 make things that seem complex and mm. distant, very real and very tangible as you're doing. So I'm, I know you're going to do amazing things for all of us through the work that you're doing with Rebalance Earth. Can we have a conversation about how relationships are playing a role in what you're doing? Because it's 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 encouraging all of us to think differently. It's creating a new kind of industry and business. Mm, yeah. And so you have to be relying on building great relationships to bring this to life. What are, what are some of the lessons that you're learning, some of the things that you're finding in doing relationships well as you get this off the ground? So I, I have a number of sort of personal mantras. The one that Jonathan will remember is begin with the end in mind. Absolutely. Uh, the, <laughs> uh, that's probably the mantra I'm most well known for. But as, as, as you know, one of my other top ones is relationships matter. Yeah. And, and actually, it's only really come to me whilst recording this podcast. But really what I'm trying to do is change our relationship with nature. One from where we just take it for granted. Yeah. A bit like how you describe, you know, you know where relation you know we just come home from work we just assume our husband or wife's going to be there we don't invest we don't think about the benefit that we get as yeah. a couple or you, you know you've been together you know i've been together with my wife now for 20 years uh you, you do, it's, it's it's easy to take these things for granted yeah. unfortunately yeah. over the last 200 years i think we now take nature for granted mm -hmm. 200 years ago we didn't take nature for granted because people understood that people's lives day to day week to week month to month right 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 and then on nature so that this shift in the, this dislocation in our relationship with nature has only really happened in the last 200 years. And this is why when people talk about indigenous communities around the world, they mm. are 100 percent in touch with nature and oh. what it means and their livelihood and their prosperity are, 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 are so intertwined. And they're the ones who will suffer first. Yeah. Is the yeah, yeah. Growing up in Jamaica, I can see that. I know that. So what you're saying is to, to some extent, the Industrial Revolution has kind of taken us away from the respect that we had for nature. Yeah. One, one, well, yeah, because if we lived in an agricultural yeah. society, we understood, Absolutely. you know, if you go back to why do you have Thanksgiving or all of these festivals, which are now just things we just do, there was yeah. a reason and a purpose for that. It was linked yeah. to the kind of the seasons and cycles of, of, yeah. of life. And it, it doesn't matter what community around the world we study. Actually, human civilization was born out of Mesopotamia, which is in Iraq, which is on the mm. on the, the river delta of, of the big rivers that, that, mm -hmm. that exist in that area. And that's because actually that was the most 
fertile plain fertile. and then it was egypt and and, and you know mm-hmm. and i know both both of you are, are big christians but you know a lot of it the cradle mm-hmm. of life came from these rivers and these fertile plains where we could grow yeah. stuff society yeah. and civilization grew out of that and and at that point you have a real feel for nature yeah what's happened and especially if we live in a city and all the rest you become very yeah so distant. Distant from nature you think milk comes from cartons rather than from cows <laughs> yeah we've <laughs> Correct. And and I think at the same time, you know, what I've been trying to do, whether it's with freedom or save your acorns, is again change people's relationships with money uh mm. so that it's not something that they're afraid of and run away from, but it's something that they actively in, engage with. And you know, it's about having awareness about money and it's also about building competence about about what to do with it. But in in my entire career, and Jonathan and I, we both worked to, together at Merrill Lynch, and I think it was about 2004 that we that, that mm-hmm. we first uh, met, 2004, 2005. Mm-hmm. And actually, you were in a relationship management role. And I remember I just read a book uh, by Malcolm Gladwell called The Tipping Point mm-hmm. and talks about sort of successful people. And one of the people he talks about is Paul Revere, uh, who famously... Uh, rode out and told everyone that the Brits are coming when, uh, at, at, you know, back 200 years ago. Now, the takeaway is that many people that night rode out and rode to other villages and towns saying, the Brits are coming, the Brits are coming, let's get ready, let's get, you know. Mm. And no one responded because no one knew who they were. Yeah. Whereas Paul Revere was known and he was trusted. And, and, and then the other thing is I looked around the trading floor at Merrill Lynch and the most successful people weren't necessarily the people who had the double first from the best universities in the world or mm-hmm. the smartest intellectually. Yeah. Actually, the most successful people were the ones who had the best relationships, either with mm-hmm. their clients or internally and were mm-hmm. able to make an organization work for them and yeah. navigate that. And and I suppose my journey in relationship management started there. and. And has developed over time. And I have a series of approaches and frameworks. You know, when we started Reddington, no one had ever heard of us. We had to convince these pension fund trustees who are incredibly conservative. Why why should we do business uh, with Reddington? Why should we do business with Darren and Rob, uh, buy into the team? And, 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 you know, what I understood is that that actually sales, or I've always sat on the side of sales as relationship rather than transactional so transactional is hey i've got this do you want to buy it yeah Mm -hmm. relationship is first and foremost you need to buy into me if you're going to buy my product or service and that takes about seven hours to get there and it takes time to build trust And, and the amazing thing is there are people today uh in the context of my new job who 20 years ago completely disagreed with what dowd and i were talking about would think uh that you know we were not quite enemies but like professionally huge friction yeah. reached out to me literally last year and said rob i love what you're up to can you come and speak at our trustee away day mm. come and join you but i i can promise you that 20 years ago or, or 17 years ago when dowd and i set up reddington this particular individual you'd think did not like us and what running doors would have been closed <laughs> this is a great example of relationships and how i think about relationships and money is that they are like you say, JTC, they're like a bank account, but more than just a bank account with credits and debits, they also compound over time, positively yeah. and negatively. And you can build trust and relationships with people who have completely different opinions. Absolutely. About things. Yeah. And the thing that I feel very lucky and privileged about now with Rebalance Earth is that when I founded, co-founded Runnington with Dowd back in 2006 I, w- I was only 27 so i didn't really have many relationships didn't know many people professionally speaking i'm talking about mm. whereas now you know nearly 20 years later age 45 i i have this huge professional network where people trust and respect what i've done and it's like magic it it it, it opens it opens doors and so i you know, one of the things I, I, I'm trying to sort of explain to my colleagues at Rebalance Earth, we're having to engage with lots of people, with city councils, with relationships yeah. I've never had before, like Plymouth City Council, with DEFRA, which is the Department uh, for the Environment, Farming uh, and Rural Affairs. You know, these are relationships I didn't have, and I'm now having to apply these skills to build them in that world. 
And then also tapping into my old pension fund relationships, mm -hmm. which I haven't been engaged with for the last four or five years because I've been at SJP mm -hmm. and pull all of that together. So, you know, professional success, obviously, you need to have a very clear vision about where we're going. And, you know, mm -hmm. we, we talked about that. Uh, you, but but at the same time, you know, you need the resources and those resources aren't just financial. So often when people talk about startups, they talk about raising money. And I think people don't talk enough about the relationships the cost, who's going to pay for yeah. your product or so who's going to pay for nature and why will they pay for nature? Uh, and how can I get in front of, uh, of the right person? And that's all down to relationships. And if you don't have a relationship with the person you want to get in front of, who in your network can connect you and, and kind of give you that warm introduction? Yeah. Because that would want to be yeah. in your corner yeah. to do it or, because or, of the trust that you've built. Or, yeah. or we'll listen to you we're talking about, um, Paul, where the Brits are coming. You, you, you can be shouting all day long, but if they don't have that relationship with you, okay, the Brits are coming, that's interesting, you know, next. Whereas if you've got a relationship and you tell me that, I'm going to listen to you because I now respect you, trust you, know that you know what you're talking about. So. And those are words that we band about a lot, but don't really pay attention to. And what I love with what you've said is, you know, you've been intentional in yeah. building those relationships of respect and trust over the years. Uh, because sometimes, especially with a more transactional mindset, we'll turn up and see what we can get from the person today because of the job I'm in and then forget about it when you change jobs. Can I can I share a story yeah. about someone who used to work at Reddington with JTC and I uh, who yeah. works in fund management? Uh, so he he got a he left Reddington when uh, got a job in fund management and you know, he was asking my advice about sales and i'm guessing the problem with then going back to fund management is then you're under like huge pressure to sell something in the next 12 yeah. months and he's sort of frustrated and i said look you've got to understand that some of the clients that we run at reddington took us five ten years and this is the parallel with investing mm -hmm. i say i have a decades not days mindset to relationships i had no idea even two years ago i would be doing rebalancer Right. So mm. if you maintain a relationship because it's transactional, I want to sell you something next week or it's not the same of taking the view. Uh, do I want to build a relationship with this person because five, 10, 20, something may come of it and something may not. It's mm. a very mm. different fundamental mindset. mindset. Changes yeah. everything. What I was trying to say to him is I said, you may or may not be at this firm that you're working on now. Try and build relationships that last and relationships of trust where they trust you and you may never do business with this person at this firm but at some point you might do business with that person and you might be a different firm or they might be a different yeah. firm but you've got to invest in it now and and too often you know in the industry of wealth management asset management and finance i see this very sort of short term sort of transactional mindset around yeah. relations bottom line yeah uh, yeah. And, 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 you know, my point is, once you think this way, don't think about my career and it's 2024 and I'm working for this firm. Just step back from it. You know, Jonathan, we worked together at Merrill Lynch. We worked together at Rennington. Then we've not worked together. You've reached out. You know, mm -hmm. you, you know uh, your son came and did an internship with me. These, these relationships yep. go up and down. But, we've, yep. you know, we've kept in contact. And, you know, our relationships had its ups and downs like any relationship. But, and, you know, underpinning that, uh, is a kind of a, a trust and a sense of of values and intention yeah. that we both buy into. Even if you know, you know, you and I are very different. I think I'm probably more similar in personality to Andrea than than I than I am to than to you. I'm I'm definitely the the mining for big gems in the mine rather than. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. You've been listening to some of the stories, right? Exactly. Well, well, as you know, that was the challenge that we had in mm. our first year of marriage. We've been married uh, 30 years now when we started the business together, just not re recognizing that difference. And I suppose that's a great segue, Rob, to talk about. You've had some amazing highs. You've built some amazing companies. You've left this track record of success yeah. everywhere you've been. Everything, everything you've touched uh, seems to turn to gold. Clearly, you come at it with this long-term relationship management perspective, which is amazing. Great message that everybody needs to hear. What bumps have you had along the way? What are some of the challenges that you've come across uh, relationally that you've had to navigate, grow through, anything you're, you're willing to share? 
without wanting to put you on the spot too yeah, much. Well, look, let me, you know, let me start at the top with the most important relationship, which is with my wife. So yeah. we met 20 years ago. Uh, uh, we worked, worked together at Merrill Lynch. Uh, you know, we've been married 15 years, uh, so kind of half halfway compared with you guys. So, uh, uh-huh. and, and, and actually, I think marriage doesn't get enough of a spotlight, if I'm honest. Too often we celebrate career success and all the rest. Yeah. And I think... Being married for 30 years is incredible, amazing. I love it when I hear people celebrate their 50 years of marriage. I think yeah. marriage as a as a, a thing that needs to be worked at and developed doesn't get enough of a spotlight. If, if Agreed. It's one of my, it's one of my refer- and no one goes on LinkedIn and go, hey, I'm... Yeah. yeah, yeah. But actually, you know, being married for 30 years is hard, right? I mean, anyone who's getting married... You, you know, even pre kids, you can't imagine what life is like when you have kids. Yeah, the trials and tribulations when they're young and they get sick versus as they get older. And we were talking earlier before this about homework and you know your mm. your kids are now you know left the nest and and, and university and following yeah. you know their their, their 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 adult lives. But you know you're still their parents right forever. So I think the, on on the last twenty years uh, we've had our uh, you know we've had our ups and downs and you know the big issue for me in the early days of reddington is that reddington became my all-consuming baby and Mm -hmm. uh it was also at the time of sort of like the rollout of sort of blackberry and you you could just basically work 24 7 i mean you can still work 24 7 now i think people Mm -hmm. are more alert to sort of putting in boundaries putting your phone on airplane mode knowing where to 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 stop yeah Uh, and and so look that yeah certainly about 10 years ago that created a huge speed bump uh that, that we had to 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 work on and and it, and if i'm honest is the sort of probably her biggest concern now about me now going all back in on, mm-hmm. on rebalance earth because she you know I, a passion I, project i have a habit of just like going boom uh well on yeah and and so i you know one of my reflections is how can i step back and can you know, you know, people talk about New Year's goals and all the rest. I don't have New Year's goals, but I have sort of like decade goals. Oh, Life goals, goals, yeah. And, and think, you know, okay, what what do I need to do? And this is why I love your your podcast and the work that you do uh, to be a better husband as different mm-hmm. to being a better father. And I think mm-hmm. we do a good job of being good parents or as good a job as one can yeah. do. But what, what that means is between my career and trying to parent, we've probably squished out our Adam, time for each other yeah. 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 and so uh you know one of my kind of new year's goals is how do we carve out more time for us together we've done some yeah. amazing family holidays together but actually we've done very little together the way that we used one, to one. So, so mm. pre pre kid so that that that's number one yeah i think the, the, the second huge relationship in in my life and is a huge relationship in your life is is Dawid. uh you know mm-hmm. he he hired me to join uh, him at Merrill Lynch. Uh, I'm 15 years younger than Dawid. We we co-founded Reddington together. Reddington together, and I, I can come back to that. We co-founded Mallow Street Mallow together. Street. Uh, uh, and you know he's got some amazing passion projects. Actually, we're probably more similar mm-hmm. uh, in, in 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 personality. But I, I think you know, again, about 10 years ago. Uh, we we ended up drifting separate days in the early days of Reddington. Dowd and I were, I'm trying to think how best to describe it, but we were like you know like a football team just passing the ball back. It was like we knew where <laughs> anyone was going to go. Yeah. Uh, but we we ended up sort of slipping into our lanes where he became more sort of focused on Mallow Street. I became more focused on Reddington. When we sort of made observations or thoughts on each one of them, it then probably wound us up in the same way that you guys mm. used to get wound up when you and were can still up. wind each other yeah. up <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. and 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 actually you know you know I, I would say that uh when Dowd gets upset he he sort of is a sort of avoidant so he'll he'll he sort of distances himself and if there was if we went back in time and tracked our sort of mobile phone calls <laughs> and messages you'd literally <laughs> see it Right, right, right. And know when something was going yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> and and again, that took real effort. In, in about 2014, at the time, we were working with a guy called Andrea Faccini, uh, mm-hmm. and 
uh, who was doing like Hogan personality tests for us to help with teamwork and hiring new people. Uh, but he he's the person who sort of first taught me about transaction analysis and adult to adult, adult to child, parent mm-hmm. child. And it's fair to say that we were both in a sort of, well, we were not in an adult to adult uh, sort of relationship. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. you know, he facilitated that, but obviously both people need to come to the table, right? Otherwise yeah. you can't have, you know, one person and, and all the rest. And then I would say since then it, you know, it's been great. And and actually now that we've got our own projects and everything else, but we're still shareholders in both Reddington and, mm-hmm. and Mallow Street, but not involved sort of from an executive sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, our relationship couldn't go better. I'd say our relationship over the last five years has has, has really bloomed. But, you know, we've known each other for, for 20 years, uh, over this, 20 years now. Yeah, this just continues that theme of seeing relationships for the long term yeah. and doing the hard work of understanding how to get on better with each other. And that applies whether you're talking about the business, whether you're talking about the senior exec team, whether you're talking about your marriage, yeah. because people are different. Life changes, seasons change, priorities change. How do you have the skills to keep having those conversations, especially the ones that get you in the gut, where you each have a very strong opinion about how things should be done? Those are skills that we're not born with, but need to learn for the long term. Exactly. I was going to say, how do do we stay together, work together, live together, whatever it is? And win together. And win together. How do we keep on that journey? You know, big shout out to you guys. 15 years. You're already an outlier in in your marriage relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but even if you think about that from a work relationship perspective, you spoke about some of those relationships being long-term relationships, you know, the bigger picture. Don't just think about, you know, this relationship now, you know, I don't like the way they're doing it, break the relationship, get out of my face kind of thing. See ya. In five years time, who knows, you know, who knows there's an opportunity to do stuff with them, to partner with them, to do things there. So long-term big picture. I'll give another one, Stephen Yang Yu, who was Mm -hmm. Reddington's first employee. So he's now spun out a subsidiary of Reddington and but he's asked me to join and be on the board and uh, I've now got a we had our you know we our first board meeting at the end of the last year and uh, I'm going to be going out this year but you know I I've known Stephen now 17 18 years you know from when he joined fresh from graduating yeah 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 uh, from from Cass uh and you know he's now you know the the CEO and founder of YYT and uh, in 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 China, and it it's just been fabulous to go on that journey with Stephen, and you know we've had different relationships. Where I was his boss, and, and you know part of it is me reprogramming and saying, yep. look, Stephen, you're the boss, you're the CEO. You've asked me to be uh, on on the board. It's your business. It's your direction. You know. Do you let, know we let, did it? We, we, sorry to jump in there. We did a podcast recently with Jeremy Lindley, and Jeremy said one of the best advice, uh, best pieces of advice he had from a boss was to say, it, it, to paraphrase it, let's work on our relationships well, because one day I'm your boss now, but there's a day, a, a day could come when you're my boss. So how I lead and how I manage you is really important because <laughs> you might want to get revenge when the tables turn as they will. This long-term perspective, not just of what can I get out of this relationship now, but who am I being in this relationship yeah. so that it will last. So yeah, that's it. Yeah, we'll put yeah. that one, because that's what you're saying now with Stephen, that technically that role, yeah, he's yeah. kind of your boss. Yeah, yeah, he's asked me, you know, he he's he's kindly given me equity in his business and, and all the rest. And I think, in his, and actually the conversation we're having at the start of the year is I said, Stephen, can we agree the roles? I think it's expectations. It's yeah. the, I said, look, I think there's the board role. And when we're operating a board, this is how I think. There's kind of mentor to you as CEO. And then there's just off the record chat where you can just call me up and say, look, Rob, here's yeah. one. I think mm-hmm. I don't know what to do. What would like, and let's define those roles. But just so you know, if you want me in a board director role and it's a board meeting, this is how I'm going to act and behave. But let's come up with a language and go, is it a level one conversation? Is it a level two conversation? <laughs> yeah, or is it a level yeah. three? <laughs> and so, yeah, so literally we had that conversation this week because I think setting up that, that sort of role clarity uh, is, yeah, is, in, is important. And the expectations, yeah. Well, yeah. In, in, in our language there, we would say in every relationship, you just have to have those conversations because absent those conversations, expectations can be set 
And if those expectations don't match, you head off down a very different path and you just keep bumping into each other and that's on, where, on that journey. That's where trust is broken. You know, when the assumptions aren't shared, then yeah. you, you'll end up disrespecting each other and breaking trust. Um, Rob, what kind of relationship advice have you had that is something you'd want to pass on to your girls or to the next generation? Just like you have this vision for, the, you know, with Red Start with young people and their relationship with money in terms of relating to people, the relationship skills that you build for the long term. What's the best advice you've heard and what's the advice you want to pass on? Well, I, I think there are many, but I, I, I want to pick one that I, has really resonated <laughs> with me is that we are a function of the five, seven, ten people we spend most time with. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and and we you know we spend most of our time at work so actually uh, th this is more kind of career advice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i'll come back to to marriage because i think it it applies there but you know who we spend time with really matters and i think really focus on finding people who will lift you up uh you know who give you energy who push you who challenge you Th that will be the number one determinant of mm. success and 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 so i've been very lucky that you know my school friends you know i'm in touch with a i was having this conversation with i got introduced to someone who left my old school 15 years ahead of me and he's okay. now in a similar space to me doing stuff in the ocean so the only connection is we went to the same school we didn't overlap mm. and we were talking about did you have a good or bad experience at school and i said i had a mixed uh i had bad and i had good some of my best friends in my entire life are from school but i also had a bad time both of those things can be true yeah and why am i still friends with those five people is because we all lift each other up we, right. we champion each other when we do well but we're there when we're in when we're in trouble whether that's you know more recently like marital problems or mm. or or, or life problems or career changes and you know so being in the good and the bad times and, and, mm -hmm. and really spotlighting your 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 friendship and uh so i think a professionally you know I, at sjp i had a really good executive leadership team I, I loved working with with them uh and you know at rebalance earth with you know my co-founder walid building that so building for me, building teams that where you all lift each mm -hmm, other up mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. it is, is incredibly important. And I think that then goes back to, to marriage, right? I mean, you know, just an interesting fact that I share in my book, but couples, healthy couples compound their wealth 77% more than those who are, are single or, or 77. not. 77. Wow. Say, say that again, Rob. So healthy healthy couples people in mm -hmm. long-term relationships mm -hmm. uh can grow their wealth 77 percent faster over time than those who don't oh now, my see, in extremis you know getting divorced can you know materially have a serious negative financial effect on on, on all parties uh but being aligned on money, making it work, not being in those conflicting decisions uh, can have a huge compound effect. And that's just because what happens is as a couple, you just end up making better financial decisions. Hopefully you have like, you can joint resources yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and so forth. Uh, and uh, again, you know, it's interesting. I'm sure, you know, everyone knows the old stat that, you know, drinking a glass of wine is 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 kind of good for you well actually what they found out mm. is that's not true if you drink a glass of wine on your own at home that's not good for you what wow. really is spending time together mm -hmm. and it's in those mediterranean communities and all the rest where they do have one glass it's the relationships the thing that people have realized the thing that came out of covid is the biggest killer bigger than smoking everything is loneliness mm. and so having high quality relationships not only is it sort of important from us at a sort of really base level but high quality relationships mean that we're more likely to make good healthy decisions about our diet about exercise about reading 
personal development. And so, you, you, you know, between, you know, as a couple, we're constantly sharing sort of podcasts, trying to rein each, you know, when we mm-hmm. make poor choices around food and end up in a bit of a rut and then get out or try and get into sort of a good exercise regime or support each other to try and do that. As you know, it's hard when you have a young family and trying to do yeah. work. This is not enough time in the day so you've really got to sort of support each other to 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 do that so yeah i think the the key thing and i think people don't spend enough time thinking about i think people spend a lot of time going where should i study what should i study but actually who you study with who you work with those relationships are really important and i would say if you're in a workplace and you don't like the people you should work you're working with that probably try and find a place where you really respect and want to want to learn learn of those people and you know you guys are a proof of that right actually it wasn't the degree you got from oxford that mattered it was your relationship that it that, was the relationship and then making the time to learn how to do relationships in the places where we turned up more as the child parent rather than adult to yeah, adult yeah. i mean i love that you brought Going up back to that, yeah. transactional analysis because quite often relationships will break down because we're not turning up well and learning the skills, doing, investing in ourselves so that we can turn up better, have a better conversation and get better results when we work with people around us serves. I mean, that is what compounds over time relationally because the better you are, the more you're able to navigate the inevitable challenges, the stronger relationship you build and the stronger support network you build so that you can shine in whatever aspect of life you're turning up to. So for so many reasons, I mean, I I love the way you make a financial link to doing relationships well. You make a a, a well-being, you know, a career link. And this is the message we want to get out there. So amazing, Rob. My best friend from school has ended up in a position where he got himself quite overweight and like, seriously overweight and I, I you know me and him had a bit of a thing and I re- and I said look mate I'm really worried about mm. you he's also sort of changed his career and you know the, it's easy to slip especially in your 40s I think it's you know something I struggle with all, 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 all the time and so we both you know we set up and, and set ourselves a challenge percentage wise to kind of get fit lose weight track it and he, he really smashed it last year but i think that's an example of relationship right you hold yeah. each other to account you call someone out and say john i'm worried about you i don't yeah. think you're uh you know let's do this together let's sign up you yeah. know it's not like a thing on linkedin and they're just giving mm-hmm. it was just a, what behind the scenes what's that conversation between me and him and we'd like check in and we'd take photos of our stood on the scales and <laughs> and, like, and then we'd slip and we go how are you doing go oh, I've, you know, i lost it a little bit and they, and they go, yeah. it's okay uh, yeah, I'm here for you. Yeah, I, 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 and I love the way I think you use the word championing. It's about championing each other um, as colleagues, you know, in the, the leadership team that you're a part of, as friends, whether it be from school or, or whoever is in the circle that you choose to be a part of, and as as spouses, as partners in life. You know, how can you champion each other? But of course, you need time. So I love the goal you've set for this year the same amount of time and intentionality that you give to other important things you want to give it to your, your, your partner, your spouse. And I agree that marriage doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Hmm. 77% is, you know, (laughs) but people for, for no other reason, that's a good reason to say, let's make this work because we both end up better off. And that's not to in any way, um, discredit or or talk badly speak badly of those who come to a point where inevitably they need to separate you know that happens life Mm -hmm. happens but it does say as much as possible put the work in to help yourself turn up better be more relationally intelligent and and invest in the relationships that matter and i was gonna say there's there's so many more things we'd love to unpack with you Rob. i think we're gonna have to get you back another time if you if you be if you if you would make yourself available down the road sometime we'd love to have you back i think there's so much we, we could talk about i did want to talk just very quickly though about your your book freedom which is just out no, so, i was gonna ask if there was any parting thoughts and then we were, were gonna go on to the book any yeah. anything that has come to mind since we've been talking that you want to end with look i again i think relationships matter 
uh, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's friendship. I think if you have healthy relationships, it helps you be healthy physically. It helps you make better decisions about diet and about exercise. Uh, good, good relationships helps you learn more, be better. We've already covered off about when you're in a good relationship or help you kind of compound your wealth better. And I, I think, you know, lots of people will focus on their diet or their exercise uh, as, as it's the new year period. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose my parting thought is make space for your relationship. So I have sort of three overriding pillars of my long-term goals, relationship, well, health first, because I think unless I'm healthy, I can't do mm -hmm. it, relationships and career. Those are my three pillars. And within relationships is with my you know, I then kind of go, well, what's my relationship with myself? I think that's really important. Yeah. Uh, what's my relationship as a son? What's my relationship as a husband? What's my relationship as a father? And those two get blurred and I want to yep. deliberately separate those out. Yep. What's my relationship with the friends that really matter? What I would say is I'm quite, you know, you don't ever tell anyone this, but I will spring clean and get rid of relationship. I mean, I never sort of, but you become more and more focused and go, I only have so much time. So where am I going to focus my relationship energy? Um, yeah, and that's so a yeah. healthy thing to do. Well, you said we're, we're a function of the five to seven people we spend the most amount of time with. <laughs> if they're unhealthy ones, why am I spending my time with them? Yeah, I've filtered them out. Yeah. And, yeah, and when you think about the people, you know, on your deathbed, long may that be delayed, who will matter to you in your life? That's where you want to put the time at the end of the day. That's, the, that's where you yeah. want it to count. Yeah. So now the book, wave the book, show us a copy of the book. <laughs> Our book's arriving today. Our son's read it. He's read it. At 18, he is so enthusiastic about the lessons there. Started his own ISA, yeah, getting his savings like, going from yeah. now. So amazing. And, and, and not just read it, but actually and taken action himself, but also sharing it with his sister, sharing it with he's university the friends, to somebody else. To friends. Yeah. He's become a, an absolute advocate of the book, yes, but also of the but more of the principles behind it and of the difference that they can make. So the message is getting through. Yeah. So wonderful. Thank you. I mean, and Robert, Robert very kindly the before we came on the on air said he'd be happy to make a gift of the a copy of the book to, to but, the first five people that, that email in. Yeah. Um, and Rob, if you just wanted to share the, the, the email address, I think you said it was going to be Lucy's email address. We'll yeah, put it in Lucy, the show notes, but just... Lucy dot Clark, C L A R K at rebalance dot earth. But we'll, we'll put that email, as you say, in, in, in the show notes. In the show notes. So the first five people to email in can get a physical hard copy posted out to them, mailed out to them. So yeah, which so is a special that. treat. Ours comes today, and I'm really looking forward to, to reading it. So, Rob, thank you so much. Thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and so many different directions we could have taken it. But um, I think we, we, we got to the nub, the essence of what we wanted to share so from many, this one. So many things in there, lifting, lifting each other up, um, the, the, you know, the five to seven clearly we know. And a lot of the stuff is not, not rocket science, but just real gold, just real, just great reminders to people of this is the stuff that really matters. Well, it's great to hear it from you because yeah. you have the track record of building great companies, working in FTSE 100 companies, and still this theme of long-term relationship management is, is what you've built life on. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. And I know there's so much more we could talk about. So yes, please, if you would come back another time. <laughs> We we'll would just, greatly we'll appreciate just set that. You up for that. <laughs> well, I, you know, you know, the answer is yes. I'd, I'd love to be back. And, and again, you know, well done to you guys. It's amazing to see from the TED talk to the book to, to, to now all of this. So, you know, wonderful. I hope, I hope this continues to compound for for many years to come. Amazing. Good Thank good. you, Rob. Thank you so much. Cool. Bye bye. Now. Take care. Bye bye. We hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you did, and you want to hear more, the best thing to do is subscribe then you'll never miss an episode. There's a new one every Friday. You can stay connected with us on social media at The Four Habits for updates, behind-the-scenes content, and to participate in discussions related to the show. We always love to hear from you. And of course, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on your preferred platform to allow us to reach more listeners and help people around the globe radically transform the way they do relationships so they too can enjoy better harmony at home, thrive at work and win at life.